reinforce the, my kind of idea that I need to propose this as a pre-conference and really try to gather people, um, you know, not just from the U.S. and Australia, but as many people internationally as possible on this topic and just see the kind of different work that we're all doing. And my idea initially was to keep it very broad, very Catholic in terms of uh, methodology, in terms of topics, in terms of um, kind of theoretical orientations, uh, and to, to really kind of embrace a multi-methods point of view, which is uh, reflective of, of my own research. So I'm really glad to see uh, in the pre-conference, there's some quantitative uh, approaches, there's qualitative approaches, um, there's going to be some exploratory data, there's going to be data that are more um, refined and, and kind of modeled. And, you know, this is, I think, really uh, healthy for the field to kind of model the diversity uh, within communication research. And so I, I really like that aspect of it. Hopefully we'll all understand each other, appreciate each other from the different uh, methods points of view. Um, and I think on the first panel, we're, we're going to see some of this diversity. We're also going to see uh, Roland's talk uh, in closing on the formation of the visual politics program um, at Queensland. And I think that would be really interesting to hear that if we're interested in this area and you're thinking, well, maybe I could um, initiate something on my campus. How do you do it? And what are the obstacles? What are the challenges? Uh, how do you kind of uh, get people on board and how do you form a, an interdisciplinary group um, that has enough coherence that it will kind of persist, but enough kind of pluralism that um, you can have a, a really big tent with it. So I thought that was appropriate. and I'm really happy uh, that Roland's able to participate. Um, so I don't want to say too much on the front end. Um, really want to get to some of the presentations. I'll be speaking later. Um, Let's see, this evening, UK time, um, well, late UK time, but um, I think afternoon-ish uh, US time. Um, and we have many different time zones represented here. So uh, it's, it's quite a feat just to pull that together. So with that, let me turn it over to Christian. He's got host duties uh, now. So he's got control of um, kind of the, the audio communications. If you're having an issue, please raise it in uh, the chat box or let us know. If you drop off, just um, re, um, kind of re-log on and then uh, we'll let you back in. All right, Christian. All right, uh, good morning from uh, Britain, everybody, and welcome. Um, thanks very much for being here. We're really excited uh, trying out this format, which obviously is not as great uh, as meeting in person, but uh, on the plus side, it enables many more uh, of us to come together that maybe couldn't have uh, made the trip to Australia. So, you know, at least that's a great plus. Um, you know, we're all experimenting with these uh, formats. So I just wanted to share a few simple tips. Uh, some of you by now will have done a few virtual conferences or workshops already. So this will not be particularly new, but just, uh, you know, a few tips. Um, first of all, the format of the presentations um, every presenter will speak for about 10, 12 minutes. Uh, that's the recommended time. And then the Q&A will follow immediately after that. Uh, this means that if your presentation goes longer than 10 to 12 minutes, you'll have less time for Q&A, uh, but you won't cut into other people's Q&A time. Um, presenters are encouraged at the beginning of the presentation to say whether they're comfortable with people tweeting about it. Uh, obviously, you don't have to tweet about anything in this conference, but if you do, uh, please use the hashtag ICA Visual Politics uh, so that we can make a little buzz uh, online. Um, the Q&A will take place entirely in the chat space uh, that uh, Eric referred to. So if you're new to Zoom, uh, at the bottom of your window, you will have a few buttons. One of them says chat. Uh, I suggest you keep that box uh, open right now so that you can see uh, the messages as they flow in real time, side by side, the uh, uh, video feed. Um, use the chat to ask any questions or even say hi and make any comments you think is useful. Um, one of the advantages of the chat feature is that you can continue discussing a paper or a topic even after a presentation has taken place. So that's absolutely fine. Uh, and you can also direct messages to particular individuals rather than to the whole uh, group. 
Uh, also, we are recording this event. Uh, Eric, apologies, I started recording one minute into your introduction because I was admitting people into the room. Um, but so this will be recorded and hopefully uh, made available somewhere in public. Uh, if any of the presenters have any issues with that, you know, you can let us know even after the, the event. Um, but we would really like for as many people as possible to take advantage of um, the, uh, you know, the, 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 this, this free conference. Um, in terms of the Q&A, uh, you can write your questions or comments in the chat box and I will, or you know, whoever is the moderator of a particular session, me in the first session, um, I will, you know, select a few and ask them directly to the speaker. Um, I'm going to, your, all your microphones are muted um, and unless you're presenting, they will stay muted. Uh, we would really like to hear your voices, but uh, it would be a bit too complicated given the fact that we don't have a lot of time and there are a lot of us to uh, have everyone uh, speaking potentially at the same time. So we're going to keep it that way unless uh, there are some particular circumstances. Um, at the end of each session, we will have a uh, coffee hour or happy hour, uh, which is obviously absolutely uh, uh, voluntary. You don't have to participate if you're too busy or just too tired or have other things to do. Uh, but we will be using uh, the meeting rooms function in Zoom, uh, which basically means uh, breakout rooms, actually it's called, uh, which basically means that we will, you will be randomly assigned to a room with a few other participants. And you can you know, mingle, have a little chat, get some coffee, get a beer, get a glass of water, get whatever you want, um, and interact with some of the participants. Again, this is completely voluntary, so if you're not interested, just leave before we do that. But it would be nice to at least get a sense of who's in the room and, and have a little chat. And we'll see how many people there are uh, in terms of determining how many rooms we're gonna make and how big the rooms are gonna be, are gonna be uh, by the time we get there. Um, we have a paper room um, and a uh, presentation uh, share drive. These are all uh, Google Drive uh, share drives. You will have received the link um, and you can access these materials, but please treat, please treat them as working papers. And finally, we have a little challenge for you. Um, uh, we have created a, a Google Doc, uh, which is a very simple document where we ask everybody who is interested to uh, just uh, uh, copy and paste images that you think are representative of the meaning of visual politics. So what does visual politics mean to you? And this could be an interesting example. This could be an iconic image. This could be uh, something that you're analyzing and that you're studying. Um, if you can post the image uh, as well as, you know, a source for that image and your name, uh, hopefully by the end of the pre-conference, we'll have uh, some interesting materials. Uh, and I'll post the link in the chat box in a minute. Uh, now, it's exactly 10 past 8, which is when we should start. And I see that uh, Nello Barile, who is our first uh, presenter, has just joined us. So let me just unmute him. Uh, and I should say, uh, Nello is presenting a paper titled uh, Lo-Fi Politics, Images of the Leader, Tactical Movements and Counter-Participative Cultures, Sardina versus Salvini, and he is from Yule University in Milan. Okay, can you see the, the screen presentation? Yes. Okay, good. Shall I start? Okay, so the, um, basically this presentation is based on a research that I already developed uh, during the uh, political um, Italian election. Uh, and now I'm, I'm developing again, uh, just to analyze this uh, uh, relation between uh, the populist leaders and the Sardines movement. So as you can see from uh, the, the first uh, slide here, uh, I mean, my reference are um, based on uh, especially Christopher Lush uh, uh, reflection on uh, the relation between uh, consumption and politics. You know, already in the 80s, we, we see that uh, politics becomes a sort of uh, exercise of consumer choices. And then um, uh, it, during the, the 90s, always uh, Christopher Lush was considering populism, already analyzing populism as a combination between 
cultural uh, conservatism and economic radicalism. And then more recently, Müller, a German scholar, um, uh, analyzed uh, populism as this idea of creating an homogeneous uh, category of people, you know, identifying everything in this uh, you know, unique and homogeneous entity, a very um, generic entity. Uh, Munch, Joshua Munch, also trying to uh, consider the populism as uh, this kind of uh, a reaction against the undemocratic liberalism of uh, illiberal democracies. And even more interesting from my point of view is uh, the Zygmunt Bauman uh, uh, notion of retrotopia. No? The, the utopia is not in the future anymore. It's not the progressive global, uh, globalist uh, utopia, but the, the uto utopia now is in the past, no? like uh, in Trump's uh, no? Make America Great Again. Uh, so this is my book of last year in which I connected the uh, uh, new populism, uh, populist communication to the polarization of society. You know, the polarization is destroying the ties between the communities. Uh, and so the populist leader are trying to write this uh, monster of the polar, polar, social polarization, and also communicative polarization, um, uh, in a sort of reaction against the left, left wing uh, narrative. Um, and this is why they are trying to hijack the so-called um, participatory culture, you know, something that uh, Jenkins explained uh, very well. This, this is something, I mean, the idea of uh, uh, communities uh, producing uh, UGC, user-generated content, and creating uh, no, uh, some strong links, uh, uh, but based on positive value, like we left wing uh, value, while the, 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 le the right-wing parties are mm, somehow remediating this logic of uh, the um, participatory culture. Um, and then, um, finally, this idea of lo-fi logic, that it's uh, something that I discovered, uh, you know, in my research, um, which is a sort of, I think I have to skip some uh, slides, it's a... Mm, uh, Lo-fi, it's a, basically a countercultural aesthetic uh, coming from the 90s American indie music, uh, which is a sort of uh, uh, reaction against the algori algorithmic uh, control of information, filtering and control of information. And this is a paradox because in a world dominated by uh, algorithms, uh, recommendation systems, and so on, we see that uh, many uh, communicative uh, styles are based on uh, analog, are trying to re, uh, re uh, uh, mediate and repropose the, the imperfection of the analog communication. No? Uh, this is something that already Jean Baudrillard uh, uh, predicted uh, in the end of 80s, saying that uh, no, we will uh, uh, reanimate uh, the background noises of the old technologies. You know, when the simulation will be uh, even more perfect than uh, you know, in that period, then we will uh, repropose uh, uh, the, the imperfection of uh, the previous technologies. And this is something, I mean, the connection between lo-fi and uh, retro, you know, retrotopia is something that we can see in different, it's, it's a global trend, it's not just an Italian thing. You know? so we can see for instance, Munch uh, analyzes the alternative for Deutschland uh, communication, saying that even if it's an uh, alt-right uh, formation, uh, uh, there are no references to the, let's say, fascist uh, imagery, but there are references to the 90s culture, so the post, uh, no, um, let's say, especially from the Eastern Europe, you know? so, so the Eastern uh, Germany, so this post-communist uh, aesthetic of small villages, uh, a sort of uh, PowerPoint aesthetics is something that Munch is <laughs> very you know, particular. And this is something that we can find also in the Trump example, no? for the, 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 this Kofeve uh, case. Uh, I don't know if you remember it you know, on Twitter, where it, it, it was just a mistake you know, of uh, typing with uh, probably big fingers and so But Kofeve became a huge trend um, and uh, with a very viral, big viral uh, power, power you know, of diffusion. 
Um, and so, um, and it was a sort of also counter remediation. Also, like the analog becomes more, the analog mistake of typing becomes more uh, viral than other digital things. No? Uh, and this is um, a song of a uh, 90s uh, uh, the singer, I mean, it's a contemporary song, but the singer comes from the 90s, uh, Perry Farrell from uh, Jen's Addiction. He decided to dedicate to Trump this uh, uh, song, you know, the, 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 the pirate uh, punk uh, poli uh, politicians. You know? And uh, uh, the idea is exactly the same that I'm developing. You know? what, what, what happens when the deconstruction, which is typical of some uh, subcultures or uh, avant-gardes like even punk oh, becomes a power uh no, goes to the power you no know, becomes um uh, you know like the politician becomes punk basically so here you see the um, hypothesis you know salvini the uh, one of the most important italian uh, political uh, populist uh, as a lo-fi hyper leader and Sardines, the left-wing movement uh, uh, created against Sardi Salvini, a lo-fi hyper movement. And basically the idea that Sardines are using a lo-fi communication just to uh, reappropriate some styles and symbols coming from the left-wing, hijacked by the populists, so from Salvini's, and then uh, reused again against the right-wing parties. No? So there is a sort of... Uh, shift of uh, codes, style of communication, so on. This is just few, uh, uh, an overview on uh, the, um, uh, the Italian uh, uh, this flu electoral fluid fluidity. It's not just Italian, of course, it is also a global uh, trend, uh, but you can see here especially uh, the, this uh, growth of Lega, the, the Salvini's uh, party, from the 6% during the European election of 2014, uh, the 70.4% uh, during the uh, uh, political um, election, uh, and then 34% uh, the new European election last year. And now there is a decline determined by the COVID-19, this coronavirus. This is something that I couldn't develop uh, properly, but uh, I will um, in the future. And the, in only a few months of lockdown, the Salvini basically declined, uh, I mean, from 34% to 27. I mean, the polling are saying that uh, there is a... And uh, here's some quantitative uh, um, data about uh, the, the, the campaign uh, of 2018 when uh, Lega uh, no, obtained 17.4%. Uh, uh, and uh, you can see the number of visualizations. Of course, I'm not commenting all the data, but it's interesting because um, if we see, we see uh, the, 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 the same data after the crisis of the government uh, determined by Salvini uh, in August uh, uh, 2019, the, 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 the numbers are much bigger. So the views, uh, the reactions, comments, and so on, uh, also the engagement of the community is much stronger, and I would say why. Um, here, just um, this uh, idea of uh, designing the community. So uh, the, the, the big success of Lega was determined not only by Salvini as a leader, but also the repositioning of the, uh, so the, the new strategy of Lega. So from the separatist approach to the nationalism. You know, Lega was just a regional party or just that limited to the north and Italy, but then they repositioned it the, uh, as a nationalist uh, party. And then um, this very ambiguous connection with the uh, alt-right and sometimes also neo-fascist. This is not a fascist uh, party, but there are some links and some connections with the uh, neo-fascists. Uh, and then this idea of uh, cognitive airbags, that is something that I always discuss. And in this case, the idea of using images to make soften the impact of, and the violence of uh, the, 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 the image of the leader. Sometimes the, the, the photo, the, the pictures, and also the statements are very aggressive, very violent. And so uh, Salvini uses some uh, airbag, like for instance, the, 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 the emoticon, the emojis, uh, or kisses or different other body languages to 
you know, uh, uh, compensate the, the violence of this message. Here you will see again this um, um, uh, geolocalized sweaters, something I call it, again, uh, from digital to the analog. No, the geolocalization is a digital device and it's a feature of some digital devices. Here, the geolocalization is analog. The, everywhere it goes, or it used to go before because now it changed the look pretty much. And uh, everywhere it, it, it went, uh, no, it, it, the, 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 the sweater was about the place visited, you know, uh, with, the, of course, particular. Um, and I was talking about emoji, which is also a lo-fi uh, uh, no uh, aesthetics from the 90s. Uh, emoji exactly here I used uh, to compensate you know, the aggressivity and the violence of uh, the message. In this case, against this guy, it's a punk uh, uh, or from a uh, German o o o NGO, uh, tweeting against him, and he was tweeting against this guy. So there was a, a, no, a big fight, on, uh, of course, about migrants, because he didn't want to accept migrants. In, uh, and here uh, about the um, uniforms, you know, sometimes um, uh, uh, Salvini is described again as a neo-fascist neo because the uniform, so this imagery of kind of dystopian imagery or this uh, the, no, new dictatorships, uh, was, no connection with the South American uh, the, the, um, um, dictators and sometimes. But this is not uh, the real um, interpretation because in this case the interpretation is very close to what uh, Pasolini used to say about. So, let's say left-wing uh, uh, intellectual, uh, even if uh, ambiguously it's a, it's a uh, left-wing, uh, about uh, the, 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 the policeman, you know? So uh, he was uh, for the police, he was um, with the policeman and against the student during the 68, uh, because uh, the, the policemen uh, are uh, um, uh, from the, the, the poor classes, while the students are sons of, uh, the, the, the rich, you know, and the, the Salvini in this case is also adopting the same rhetoric, you know, he's always uh, uh, wearing uh, the policeman or you know, any kind of uniform uh, because he's uh, emphasizing this, uh, uh, you know, connection with the, you know, the, the less uh, privileged. Uh, Nello, you have five minutes left. Okay, good. Uh, relocalizing the, uh, this food porn, uh, it was called the permanent oral state, uh, eating everywhere, in, a, in every you know, situation, location, of course, the local food, so connecting with the gastronomic. Eh? And here, um, the, um, called, uh, this was called the war from the rooftop, no? this uh, uh, idea of a lo-fi superhero uh, sending some messages from the rooftop, and the other leaders also replying to this uh, uh, weird, uh, strange uh, location, also you know, making videos from the, the, the other room. Here, uh, also the idea of um, using fake, producing fake news against, uh, uh, to protect some particular uh, marginalities, so minorities, like uh, people with disabilities, and putting them against the migrants, for example. We protect uh, the Italian uh, uh, you know, people with disabilities against the migrants because the left-wing parties are just protecting the migrants. No? So there is also this idea. Um, here, the, uh, some images, again, you see the, this uh, very aggressive uh, image of uh, you know, using a gun, holding a gun, connected to this algorithmic um, management of uh, images. So the, the Morisi, here is the guy, is the, the spin doctor and the, let's say the, 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 the communicative uh, consultant advisor, no? in the, using some uh, you know, algorithmic strategies to um, to, to, to make him uh, popular. And then um, this is a light uh, the, for the, the, the uh, right wing formation allied with uh, um, Salvini, Giorgia Meloni, who became very popular using this meme, uh, Io sono Giorgia, in which uh, uh, he's you know, just uh, claiming, I am a woman, I am a mother, I am a Christian. And the video became uh, uh, with the techno. Um, rape uh, sound music soundtrack became a very popular meme uh, especially against the lgbt movements uh, and so on no? uh, photo bombing protests here tactics are um, uh, no and sometimes uh, the, this idea of a tactical communication is uh, 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 no um, sometimes um, determining the reaction of common people using some tactics in this case exactly the lgbt movement 
you know, so two girls kissing each other during the selfie, you know, and he, you can see his face with a big, uh, and he travel. And now he, um, uh, this is a recent uh, image, very different image, you know. It's look uh, like a sort of uh, traditional politician, uh, intellectual during the COVID. In this very uh, particular case of um, uh, Silvia Romano, who was kidnapped by Al Shabab, and she came back converted to uh, the, 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 uh, the, the Islamic religion and wearing uh, this uh, you know, traditional suit from uh, Somalia. And this was a huge bomb you know, in terms of visual communication because there was a big debate and very violent uh, and aggressive debate uh, polarizing again the two factions you know the right wings and the law and as you can see here the numbers are much bigger after the crisis of the government uh, august 2019 you know? and after this crisis uh, uh was born the movement of sardines because they they are uh, figure out left wing uh, especially youth uh, they figure out that salvini was you know, he became too popular and too powerful in terms of communication. So this movement, uh, starting from the left-wing uh, field, uh, decided to readapt the same lo-fi logic. Uh, you can see the sardines means, uh, you know, we are uh, 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 very tight and we can uh, put, you know, bring too many people in the square just because we are very close, we are very tight. Also a metaphor of the new ties, you know, between the young uh, generations uh, um, and uh, anyway I cannot comment on the sardines uh, but uh, it's interesting to see that now recently under the Covid uh, crisis uh, both Salvini and uh, uh, um, sardines uh, are almost uh, I mean are um, less visible less uh, meaningful less uh, important you know so this uh, virus is somehow uh, it was also called uh, the sovereignist uh, populist virus and so on, but it's somehow hiding uh, uh, or um, you know reducing the, the communicative power of the populist uh, and also the counter cultures and the counter participatory culture of the sardines. I think I can close here. I'll finish here. Brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Nello. Uh, thank you. We are at time, I'm afraid. So I hope uh, there will be questions and comments for you in the chat box later. And of course, you know, we can all okay. get in touch um, with each other. Uh, so I would now like to move to our next speaker, uh, who is Morgan Belhadi from uh, Paris Trois Sorbonne Nouvelle University, um, who is going to talk about French contemporary populism, the building of a specific aesthetic and mode of representation, question mark, and analysis of campaign posters. Yes, okay, so thank you. Uh, so my, my main question today will be, how does visual politics help French populist parties to spread their ideologies and create a unique connection with the people? And to answer this question, um, I will start, uh, I will focus uh, this study on the poster a supposedly old-fashioned medium, but relevant in the French case in particular, for many reasons, and among them, uh, the poster is easily accessible. It's an excellent reminder of an electoral deadline, and uh, with its large scale and popular diffusion, it best suits populist needs, a quest of immediacy, the expression of emotions, uh, the display of popular signs, the synthesis of arguments throughout a two-dimensional surface, and so on. So uh, my corpus, corpus will be composed of uh, posters, as I was saying, from 2002 to 2019. Um, and uh, the methodology uh, will be based on um, interdisciplinary uh, approaches uh, coming from communication studies, semiology, iconology, and intermediality. Unfortunately, today I don't have time to, to talk about this because I want to move on to the analysis itself, uh, starting with the National Front. So the National Front um, was founded in 1972 by Jean-Marie Le Pen uh, on the basis of New Order, which is not a, the musical band, obviously, um, and, uh, but a far-right nationalist party in France, and the NSI, uh, an Italian neo-fascist party, uh, which helped finance the National Front and gave it its famous flame as a logotype, as you can see. Uh, and one of the main arguments that makes Jean-Marie Le Pen a populist and outsider politician was that, as he says, he claims out loud 
um, to uh, what the French think quietly. However, whereas he has participated in almost every elections, um, during the 2002 presidential campaign, it is the first time that he is nominated for the second round. Uh, and as you can see, uh, in, uh, the poster produced then is radically distinct from the one produced in the first round. Uh, and I want to um, talk about this right now, about the differences between these two posters. Um, the second one um, on your right side uh, uses black and white photography. Le Pen wears an elegant outfit and he looks humble by not looking at us as he used to in previous posters. The flame, uh, the traditional flame I just talked about, has been replaced by a logo that combines the name of Le Pen and the figure of the country um, on the left side uh, at the corner. And uh, this new logo conveys the idea that he embodies France as a nation. So um, in this sense, we can say that celebritization and de-demonization uh, have been launched uh, with this 2002 election, even though uh, there were um, uh, some uh, members uh, that wanted it to start earlier in the 90s. So then in 2007 and 2012, um, despite the change of leader from Jean-Marie to Marine Le Pen, um, this uh, de-demonization policy continues um, by making Jean-Marie and uh, then Marine Le Pen more accessible to look uh, more patriots rather than nationalists. They even use a kind of Goyan gesture, uh, Goyan from uh, the General de Gaulle, um, who, was, uh, who is a historical reference in France and um, who was famous for, re he reunited um, the country after World War II. Uh, so Jean-Marie and Marine Le Pen are using this uh, gesture and um, also the slogan, Oui la France, Yes France, uh, can refer to that. It is, has kind of positive connotations that uh, the National Front were, was not accustomed to. Um, and then let's move on to 2017 presidential, uh, presidential elections. Uh, so maybe you're more familiar with these two posters because uh, uh, the media talked a lot about them. Uh, the demonization reaches its peak as Marine Le Pen decides to kill her father in 2015 um, uh, and introduce more appealing themes uh, to make her party more accessible, um, acceptable. And on these poster, on these posters in 2017, uh, the name of the party uh, has been replaced by uh, the slogans "In the name of the people" in the first round and "Choose France" in the second round. Uh, the logo, the logo is a blue rose. Uh, so let's talk about this now, um, because this blue rose recalls both French left, as the red rose is its emblem, and the right, as blue is its emblematic color. But it can also convey feminine stereotypes. In fact, Marine Le Pen has worked a lot on her personal image to appear more feminine, reassuring than her father. Uh, blue is also the color of the Virgin in Christianism. And we know that the National Front um, also uh, wants to focus on uh, its Christian electors. So it's important for, for them too. Um, and in the second round uh, on this uh, poster, uh, she emphasizes her feminine features as well, a slogan on her breast, uh, showing her leg, uh, which is a choice she justified by saying it would serve feminist liberty as opposed to Islam. So it has become one of her main arguments to say she was uh, more feminist um, than before. Additionally, uh, French presidents are accustomed to making a photograph in front of the official uh, presidential library after they got elected, but here obviously she, she's not elected yet, uh, but by posing in front of um, a library, uh, it looks like uh, she wants to, to say uh, she has the set to, to become the next president. So for all these reasons, uh, by putting the slogan in the, in the name of the people above the candidate's name, by calling herself by her first name to avoid uh, Le Pen's name, uh, by posing in front of this library and showing off her femininity like no one before, uh, we can say that these two posters can be considered populist and disruptive in the way they represent the candidate. In June 2018, the National Front becomes the National Rally um, and uh, going to um, 
uh, Marine Le Pen's ambition to uh, de-demonize uh, the party and uh, make it more accessible and um, uh, open to alliances. And um, many things have changed in terms of um, the aesthetic of, um, of, the, of the party. Uh, there are only two colors used, blue and white. Uh, it's um, very uh, stylized and modernized, um, as well as for the logo. But still, uh, the logo is still inspired by the MSI uh, with uh, this flame, a stylized flame, but still it's a flame, uh, with this open circle, uh, open to alliances. Uh, Marine, Le Pen, uh, Marine Le Pen, sorry, explains it. Um, there should be no doubt now that uh, we can be a ruling party and not a protest party anymore. So she wants uh, to be the first um, Emmanuel Macron's opponent. But there is um, another politician who aims to compete with Emmanuel Macron, and um, this is uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. Um, so I'm trying to go faster. Um, so um, in 2012, uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon is the leader of the Left Front, um, founded during 2009 uh, European elections. The Left Front um, is um, a, co a coalition between left parties and the, communist, the French Communist Party. And it is well reflected uh, when uh, uh, we look at uh, uh, the colors used. Uh, red colors for communism, green for eco the ecologists. Uh, in his public appearances, Jean-Luc Mélenchon wears a worker's jacket, um, which can remind us of uh, the symbol worn by communists deported by the Nazis in the World War II, but also it was also populari popular, uh, popularized sorry, in the 60s, 70s uh, by proletarians and Trotskyists. Uh, so it's a way for Mélenchon to target a generation he belongs to, and to show he, he inherited uh, from them. In the 2012 and 2014 uh, presidential and European election, um, um, the left front wants uh, to symbolize the rally and promote uh, the following ideas, uh, uniting the people from every nation, as we can see uh, with the yellow star on, your, on the right side of your, ski, uh, of your screen. Um, also, giving the power back and priority to the human, uh, let's impose human first, as it says, uh, hoping that people from all over the world will rise up and make a revolution, uh, as symbolized by the red color uh, that is uh, predominant in uh, all these posters. Um, so, in 2017, uh, while Jean-Luc Mélenchon is at the head of a new movement, France and Bout, the same ideas remain especially giving the power back to the people uh, as the slogan, the people's strength um, and a shared future puts it. Uh, but what has obviously changed is the design and aesthetic of posters, uh, which precisely imply significant changes in terms of Mélenchon's image, communication and France and Baud's strategy and sim symbolism. About the symbol, as a matter of fact, the emblem chosen to represent uh, this movement uh, is a Greek letter, uh, phi, from the initials of the movement, F-I in French. Uh, it may symbolize the Greek golden number of harmony, the upside down uh, six for the sixth republic that uh, claimed by Mélenchon, but also a raised fist for a sign of rebellion and untamed attitude. Uh, the red color is still used, of course, here and there, uh, but is more discreet and the blue sky color uh, is imposed and has never been uh, has never been seen before in French political imagery. So that's kind of new, uh, and it also shows that um, France and Vaud wants to keep communism, far left affiliations aside uh, to gather more electors. Um, and talking about uh, Jean Luc Mélenchon, his ethos uh, has changed too. He wants to prove uh, he has become uh, wiser, he's a kind of philosopher um, who still wants a popular revolution to occur, but in a more peaceful way. And I will finish with uh, these posters, uh, produced in 2009 for the European elections. France and Bout also tries to distinguish itself by trading candidates on an equal stage and highlighting feminine ones in particular uh, to claim um, uh, its uh, feminism. Uh, so it's the case with Manon Aubry uh, for this election, but I guess 
I'm running out of time, so I'm going to conclude here and uh, by saying that um, first, I hope I have demonstrated throughout this great analysis of posters that uh, these two parties, iconographies, accurately reflect the different features of populism, the opposition between us and them, um, a specific kind of people, exclusive nationalist one or inclusive one for France and Belt. Um, the importance of a leader and its connection, um, connection identification with the people, the importance of the medium uh, used here the poster, and of expressing ideas in a disruptive way as it was done in 2017. Even though we have examined the short period of, of election, uh, the radical shift between uh, before and after 2017 is obvious for these two parties and it shows their will to become populist rulers rather than just protesters. So this to me unveils the role of visual politics and their strategies to publicize their ideologies. Thank you. All right, thank you, Morgan. Um, okay, there is a comment that has just arrived uh, from Uta Rusman. Hi, Ruta. Um, and she says, based on your analysis, can you conclude uh, that there are certain criteria that are used by uh, political groups in the populist right versus the populist le left individuals. Like, can you, can you define a set of criteria that you think could be possibly generalizable and used in future studies and, and how these two groupings communicate visually? Uh, so the different uh, populist features between uh, the right and left? Yes. Is that the question? Because I can see the, the question on my screen. Um, yeah. So I think, as I, uh, as I have just mentioned, um, that um, looking at all these posters, but not only posters, uh, in more general, the uh, visual communications we use, um, they all try to, uh, um, uh, to, to create antagonisms, uh, strong oppositions uh, between two groups um, with um, simplified ideas, Yes, no, uh, no for Europe, yes for, I don't know, uh, for uh, the Europe of nations and things like that. Um, so they, they both have this in common. Um, they try to be disruptive uh, in, their, um, in, in their aesthetic uh, by using uh, strong images, uh, by being a bit provocative. Uh, they want uh, the media to talk about them. And um, um, what else? Um, so, sorry, I'm a bit uh, distracted by. Um, so I think they uh, well reflect um, the main features of populism uh, in this way. Uh, the dichotomy um, the, um, in, in society. Um, can I, can I ask you, I mean, I, I don't see any other yes. comments. I, I'm just going to articulate something that I quickly wrote uh, in the chat box. Um, and again, you know, for all participants, you know, please keep that box open so you can participate and see what other people are saying. Um, you know, I think- uh, I'm finally was, able to, to see the, the chat good. box. I, I think there was an interesting uh, maybe contrast between your presentation and Nello's presentation where, you know, you clearly showed, you know, when these parties went from, you know, protest to aspiring to be in government, they adopted a communication that was, you know, in a way a lot more like the ones of the mainstream parties, you know, very polished, uh, very non-controversial uh, and, and quite professional, right? Um, whereas what Nello showed us with respect to Salvini in particular was this idea of, you know, surely being professional when it comes to exploiting social media algorithms, but also making it a point that you're you're not polished, you're you're natural, you're um, you're you you don't communicate like the others. Um, and so I was wondering if you had any thoughts about you know how these two styles of if, if these two styles of campaigning can be can coexist or if there are alternatives that for for the populist parties. Um. Yes, I think uh, what is interesting about these parties is that uh, they are trying to, to make a balance between uh, being uh, Polish, as you, as you just said, uh, being conventional because they want to, to be rulers and uh, still being uh, kind of protesters, 
uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon uh, uses very much uh, the importance of demonstration. Uh, he used to do that uh, before in 2009 and 12, but he still is today. Uh, he used the hologram, uh, which is uh, kind of new in politics, um, so which reflects uh, his uh, very uh, receptive to new modes of communications. Um, the National Front, National Rally uh, has been um, a pioneer in uh, the use of uh, the internet. Um, so in this way, they are uh, very uh, using uh, innovative uh, approaches. Uh, so it's a very difficult balance because every time uh, they want to, to claim uh, they are kind of mainstream parties, um, they are um, uh, criticized uh, for, for not being mainstream. And at the same time, uh, they want to pretend they are not that mainstream uh, that people may think. Uh, which is a way of, uh, as uh, the um, other uh, presenter said, uh, a triangulation, I think, uh, to attract uh, the wider electors as possible. Okay, thank you very much, Morgan. That was very interesting, and thanks for uh, keeping time as well. Uh, thank please... you, and sorry for my English. <laughs> No, no, no worries. Uh, please unshare your screen uh, so that uh, Devan Shah can now come in. I'm going to unmute you now, Devan. Uh, hopefully it works. So how do you unshare? Uh, there's a button. Go, go to the top and there should be a red button somewhere. Uh, ah. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. Now I am trying to, okay, Davan is unmuted, I think, right now. And so hopefully he can start sharing his screen. Right, and while he does that, uh, very pleased to introduce uh, Davan Shah from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, who is going to talk about Trump's transgressive debate style and the televised performance of populism. Thanks for being with us, Davan, and the floor is yours. And can you people see my screen? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. All right. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, joining this uh, uh, as kind of a last second edition. So I wish I had a, a paper. Instead, I'm going to give a bit of a tour through a, a, a line of research that Eric Busey and I have been pursuing um, since starting in my last sabbatical. And so it was literally seven years ago. Uh, 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 and, and, and to really kind of expanding on a, a, a set of questions that have been lurking in political communication and in, in, in visual politics for, I think, some time. And, and that central question is the, the question between watching and listening to debates. And what is it that happens, uh, you know, the question, you know, starting with the uh, 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 Lang and Lang and the question of uh, uh, debates and news coverage and, and, and the attention to uh, visuals versus attention to uh, uh, what candidates say uh, is a question that I think, you know, we have always been thinking about, but the techniques for kind of sorting it out have been challenging. Uh, uh, think of Druckmann's work, uh, uh, looking and finding subjects with no knowledge of the 1960 debate, which I think is kind of an amazing ability to find them in America, uh, 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 even at, especially at a Midwestern university. Um, but he managed to find those individuals and test uh, whether or not uh, uh, seeing uh, uh, versus hearing uh, uh, affected debate evaluations, and it did. Eric, and uh, uh, working with his colleagues, has found Nixon's nonverbals were far less visual appealing than Kennedy's, more aggression, more inappropriateness, more stress, more evasiveness. Um, and so we know there's differences. There's differences in style and there's differences in uh, uh, the substantive evaluations of, of observers. Um, but what we also know is that television itself and the way that political confrontations are presented has grown more contentious. And I think here of work by people like Mutz and Reeves and looking at literally how viewing and civility in talk shows increases interest but erodes trust, and literally that is amplified by production choices. Production choices of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, showing people in split screen formats, increasing close-ups. And we've seen that same type of production 
value shifting over now to uh, uh, debate presentations with almost all networks now using a split screen format. Um, and uh, Jay Ho Cho uh, uh, at UC Davis uh, 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 kind of has, has done work on this, looking at this question of whether that split screen format actually heightens the perception of conflict, and it does. Now, what I think is unique about the line of work that Eric and I have been pursuing, mainly with Chris Wells and then uh, with a number of our students, is the question of how this visual politics of debates intersects with social media. And how does the first screen of television, uh, 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 you know, shape responses via the second screen, uh, laptops, tablets, smartphones, because we dual screen, we all do it. We are probably, many people are doing it right now. They're watching <laughs> this presentation, but they're also on their smartphones. They're also on a tablet. They may be actually doing something else on the computer while they're listening to this talk. And the question is, when we're doing that and we're commenting or even posting in the comments thread, what spurs a response, right? Is it, is it how a person appears? Is it what they're saying? Is it how they say it? And, and that is, again, that question lurking behind the visual politics of debates. And one of the interesting things that we believe this particular combination of looking at debates within the context of social media allows is the testing of biobehavioral theories to our responses to television content. And so, what well, Eric and I describe this as is our Reese's peanut butter cup moment. And uh, uh, I don't know if anyone can see Eric right now, but I hope he's smiling. Uh, um, we were having a conversation during a visit to Texas Tech that I had during my sabbatical uh, uh, seven years ago. And he was talking about visual coding he was doing, and I was talking about social media and computational analysis I was doing. And suddenly there was this opportunity to combine the two and create something kind of new. And what we did at that moment was combine visual and verbal coding of the 2012 debates. Eric and his team had conducted that at Texas Tech. They'd taken the 90 minute debate and divided it into about 170, 180 codable segments. And then they had identified a series of nonverbal elements that were coded within it, tone of voice, emotional displays, gesture valence, blink rate, and then we also coded it then for certain rhetorical elements, attacks, contrast statements, responses, looking at more of the kind of rhetorical layer. But what we could then marry that with was um, Twitter content that we harvested from an archive that we built at Wisconsin, which is a 10% archive of global Twitter, about uh, um, 40 million global tweets per day. Um, we have now restarted that specifically on COVID-19. Um, and again, this is accessible through the uh, uh, Twitter streaming API, and then we warehouse that, uh, and we've maintained that and have that archive uh, uh, for research purposes. So we combine these two, and what that allowed us to do was take Eric's fine-grained coding of things like expressive displays, you know, Obama being happy, Obama being, uh, 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 um, you know, uh, uh, neutral, Obama being you know, evasive, Obama being angry, um, uh, and thinking about it within a very fine-grained system of his biobehavioral coding. So literally thinking about, you know, is where are someone's eyelids positioned or where are their eyebrows positioned and thinking about those as markers for classifying certain kinds of facial displays. Um, where is, you know, are someone's lower teeth showing? That's more <laughs> aggressive or their upper teeth showing, well, that's more of a, a, a happy display. And thinking about those notions and that kind of attentive coding uh, uh, at these increments. And so what this let us do is then combine and run time series models where we were able to look at, was it the rhetorical features, was it the tonal characteristics, or was it the visuals that were driving the responses to both the volume of Twitter expression and the sentiment of Twitter expression. What we found was, well, rhetorical features matter and, and meme generation, mainly what we found was memes matter. Rhetoric didn't matter much at all, despite what rhetoricians would tell us about debates. Um, total characteristics matter to some degree, but mainly expressions of anger and frustration that generated a kind of volume of response, not much in terms of 
uh, uh, incremental variance explained in terms of sentiment. But the visual elements, which were and the third characteristic, they were beyond the rhetorical and tonal, so a very, I think, strict test, were the most consistent predictors. Um, and mainly angry and threatening expressions and, and things like blink rate showing nervousness or evasiveness. And so this was, I think, interesting support for the underlying theory. Uh, and, and let us think about the idea that, yes, uh, 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 the visuals certainly do matter. They're the most consistent factor here. Angry and threatening expressions and affinity gestures and then blink rate and then kind of sudden variations in rate uh, of being particularly characteristic of driving responses. Now, that was interesting, but when you think about the 2016 campaign, we have a very different context. We have, for starters, uh, Eric and, and his team coded debates at a much finer grain increment, and then my team at Wisconsin did additional computational coding of those same 10-second debate increments. We also expanded the coding of different features, including things like interruptions and verbal non-fluencies, um, and we had much better social media data because rather than a 10% sample, we purchased from GNIP a full archive of all Twitter content during both debates. Uh, um, now, the one hugely complicating and challenging factor and one that I'm really curious about people's reactions to is the gender dynamics within these debates and how that's coupled with Trump's populism and how that potentially posed a challenge to Hillary Clinton. So, when we think about the rise of population, populism and populists, um, you know, one of the things that we know is that it's a particular style. It's a verbal style. It's a style of, uh, 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 that's been a winning style. And it's, we've seen a rise in vote share. We've also seen a rise in discourse on the right and the left that is characterized by that kind of verbal style of aggressiveness, blaming, uh, 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 engaging in many of the kind of tactics that we've already heard about uh, uh, and that I imagine that we'll hear about throughout the rest of this conference um, as people tackle both the intersection of visual politics with populism. Um, but beyond the kind of question of what populists say and whether someone is more or less populist on the right or left, which is not something we're particularly interested in, we're more interested in the question of what does populism look like? What is a populist kind of set of visual markers or displays? And to kind of get at that, we think of key variables like anger and threat displays, frowning, fixed stares, defiance gestures, um, nonverbal disagreement, inappropriate displays, and things like hostile interruptions. Now, those are also verbal, but they're also sometimes very physical. Uh, as you can see, you know, Trump holding his hand up in that image, for example. Um, but there's also a, a, an oral component to this, right? There are verbal non-fluencies. Uh, uh, populists speak simply and sometimes speak in broken sentences and incomplete phrases. Uh, they engage in character attacks. They use angry and threatening tones. They use anger language, and we coded that using linguistic inquiry word count system. They use blame language, which we coded using diction scores from Rod Hart's program. And their verbal sophistication level is generally lower. And so we indexed against using high or more sophisticated words. Now, here's what's fascinating. And I'll try to do this quickly because I know I'm running out of time. Um, when you compare Trump and Clinton's debate style, the top is the nonverbal displays and the interruptions and the verbal displays, you can see how much more of all of these markers Trump is using compared to Clinton. It's incredible. Now, even if you move to the second debate where Clinton is engaging in more aggressive activities, Trump maintains uh, uh, his, his posture. Clinton tries to kind of up uh, 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 and engage in a more aggressive line, both visually uh, uh, and verbally, but can't exceed Trump. Now, is Trump just doing this because it's a gender difference? This is Trump compared to Romney and Obama in 2012. He's still the most aggressive by far in every one of these, the facial displays, the verbal tone, the gestures. And so it's a fascinating difference. Now, here's what's even more interesting. When we combine this now, this is again for the first and the, the, the third debate. Um, what we're able to do, as I said, for 2016 is combine 
those 90 minute debates now chunked in 10 second increments rather than 30 second increments and then coded for this range of kind of populist characteristics we just showed along with things like happiness and reassurance and memes and uh, uh, other characteristics and then we married that with that same social media data so yes volume of mentions vary a great deal over the course of uh, 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 the debate uh, uh, we can look at the we're going to look at the first here we could also look at the third um, what's more interesting is when we look at what's driving the response in terms of the relative attention to Trump, what we see here is a huge factor in terms of his visual aggressiveness, right? His visual aggressiveness drives the domination of the message about Trump online, much more than anything he's saying or any tonal characteristic. For Clinton, it's much the opposite the the visual matters but kind of as a slow burn and frankly the the verbal matters but that also takes some time to generate so we don't get the same type of energy and the same type of dominance that trump is able to display and dominate the 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 discourse in the social media space during the debate so what does this tell us um you know Populist visual and verbal styles drove the Twitter response. Uh, uh, that was certainly true for Trump. Uh, 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 even when Clinton tried to match, uh, uh, that certainly helped, but never was able to eclipse. Um, Twitter using public uh, 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 was reactive to Trump's visually aggressive style. Uh, responses to aggressive nonverbal behaviors at every time lag tested were significant and highly significant and quite strongly predictive. For Clinton, those verbal, I mean, those visual markers were only kind of modestly uh, uh, significant at the 0.05 level. Uh, uh, and again, the effect sizes are smaller. The other thing we see is less responsiveness to Clinton's verbal efforts uh, 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 at assertion. You know, argument, rhetorical tactics take longer and, and draws a slower response. Um, so in the face of populist attacks, those verbal parries may have less resonance and effectiveness. Now this could also be a double bind for Clinton as a female candidate who was kind of boxed in in terms of what her, her tactics could be in that moment. And it was also probably a calculus against whether the public, what, what Twitter responds to versus what the public in general responds to. Um, and so we think second screening is a space to continue examining this because it's kind of a spin room where people gauge performance and discuss it. And it's so driven by visuals that we need to understand it as people looking at visual politics. Um, the other thing I'll do a quick plug for here, I know this is a visual politics group, but I'll say I think computational methods uh, uh, is kind of key for visual politics. Uh, 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 many of the tools for understanding visual politics uh, uh, can, can uh, visual aspects can, can, by, can, can be integrated with that. And oftentimes this requires data integration of the science of team science and the story of you know, Eric and his team who are the visual coding specialists and, and my team who do more of the computational work has been a really fascinating combination here. And, and speaking of the science of team science, this is based on lots of work by lots of different authors. And so they should all get credit, even though my name is on the presentation, but uh, uh, Alex Hanna, who's uh, now at Google and Eric, Chris Wells, uh, uh, but also uh, uh, students of ours like Zheng Huang uh, uh, and co uh, uh, collaborators like John PV House. Uh, um, and so, you know, again, uh, many, many different people involved in this. And thanks for listening. I think I've used all of my time. Thank you very much, Stavan. Uh, we have a couple more minutes. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, interesting discussion in the chat while you were talking about computational methods for visual content. Uh, so I wonder if you, you know, you've said quite a few interesting things already. I wonder if there was anything you, you wanted to add in terms of, you know, introducing perhaps this, these kinds of methods to, you know, what is uh, obviously a very diverse group of scholars here. Well, I, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm someone who has, over the course of my career, grown tired of the kind of um, quantitative qualitative distinction and, and, and even the value of thinking about research in those terms. I, I would say the same about computational. I think computational is a tool in our toolbox. I think it's one of an arsenal of things that we use and it, it gives us ways of gathering and looking at data sometimes in a more systematic way, being able to sample or archive large pools of data. So 
I think it's an instrument. I don't think it's an answer to everything. I don't think it's a, I'm not trying to be an evangelist in that sense. I'm saying it's an opportunity for people who are interested in applying different tools to engage in both quantitative and qualitative work and sometimes more descriptive work rather than hypothesis testing work, sometimes more uh, uh, sy systemic work rather than work trying to necessarily uh, uh, deal with a causal process. And so to me, it just opens up a lot of avenues. Sorry, I think we can all agree to that. Uh, so thanks very much again, Davan, for participating and for a very interesting talk. And it now is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, if I can unmute him. Yes, I think he is unmuted. Um, I am very pleased to introduce uh, Roland Bleicher from the University of Queensland, um, who you know, has kindly agreed to give a keynote where he's gonna tell us about uh, the experience of, of his group and his team in establishing visual politics and the challenges and the opportunities in doing that. Uh, thanks very much for accepting our invitation, Roland. Over to you. Thank you so much, Christian. Um, can everyone hear me, see my slides? Yes. Oh, good. Well, pleasure to see you all, be with you. I wish we could have done that in real here in Queensland, um, but instead um, we have this virtual space, perhaps uh, in addition, or instead with more people than we could have put into a room uh, in a conference setting. So thank you very much for Eric and Christian for the opportunity to say a few words to you today. Um, I will uh, do something quite different from the previous three papers by Nello, Morgan and Davan. It's not a paper that I'll be presenting. Uh, let me see. It's not a paper that I will be presenting uh, as briefed by uh, Eric and Christian, but instead, what I would like to do is present some reflections on my experience of having worked on visual politics and particularly of having sort of established and run um, a research program, an interdisciplinary research program on visual politics here at the University of Queensland. So I'll say first a few things about how that came about, how I became interested in the topic, and then primarily I want to talk about the lessons we have learned from running this program over the last five or six years, um, um, both uh, the positive ones and, and some of the challenges we have uh, encountered. Um, if there's time, uh, and I'm Swiss, I'm going to be very strict about time. So, uh, so if there's time, I'll say a few words about one of the pilot projects we have established on visualizing a humanitarian crisis. And uh, I would love to have um, enough time for some kind of discussion to the extent that this is possible in the context of a forum like that. So that's what I have in mind. Uh, I've gotten the brief for about half an hour. I probably will be, hopefully it will be slightly uh, shorter than that. So let me say a few words about how I got interested in all that. Uh, I come from a discipline of international relations, uh, different from, from most of you, I presume. And when I started off about 30 years ago, international relations was a very, very narrow discipline. Uh, it was basically about uh, studying states uh, and guns and bombs and doing so through social scientific methods. And I sort of was quite frustrated with that as a PhD student, a young scholar. And I tried to basically find different ways of talking about politics. So I've started writing about aesthetics uh, and aesthetic approaches to politics. With aesthetics, I mean not just art, but basically validating a broader set of insights into politics, not just those stemming from the social sciences, but also those from the humanities, uh, including the role of emotions, the role of, of, of sensual experiences. And so I started work on that. I did work, for instance, on using literature to rethink political dilemmas. I uh, started working on music and politics. And over the years, and I've done some conceptual work as this essay here on the aesthetic turn in international relations, which is about 25 years old. So that's sort of the origin I had in my interest in aesthetics, which then about a dozen years ago focused more and more on, on visual aspects of the various aesthetic approaches. I still have an interest in broader approaches, but I've become particularly interested in, in visuals. So I started to do research on that. I'm not gonna bore you with, with the, the, the publications, but I also started to teach on that. So I've done a course in about 15 years ago on art and politics, for instance. I ran a course on visual politics, um, that's about a decade ago. 
uh, at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. I grew up in Switzerland originally, and when I was a visiting fellow there, I ran a course on, on visual politics. So these are themes that sort of have started to research, have started to teach. And then here at the University of Queensland, about a, a dozen years ago, I established a research program or research group cluster on visual politics. Initially, this was a very small, informal group in our department uh, with people in politics, international relations. So we sort of met every few weeks and we talked about common research interests. People presented their grant proposals, their draft papers. Uh, we also ran a photography competition, mostly for our students and, and alumni. And then we had a panel every year that um, uh, judged the, the photographs. Uh, my colleague, Seb Kemp, ran a film series uh, that was quite popular. And so we had the occasional events. And that sort of bubbled along. It was quite interesting and it was sort of very informal. And then about, I can't remember exactly, maybe six, seven years ago, our faculty announced um, a scheme, a grant scheme, to promote interdis interdisciplinary research across the faculties uh, for sort of a three or four year program. And you could apply. And so I put something in on visual politics, and there were overall 70 applications. So there's a lot of interest in interdisciplinary work. Then we sort of had a second round of the of the grant scheme where all these 70 projects sort of ideas came together. And I then teamed up with a range of other uh, um, uh, kind of uh, uh, proposals, and we ended up putting together a sort of a completely interdisciplinary proposal on visual politics, and it ended up being one of two uh, proposals that were funded for a three or four year period. So the idea of this program was basically to bring together scholars who work on visuals across a wide range of different disciplines. So we had around 50 people, and we still have around 50 people associated with the program in various functions, very loosely. Some just turn up for the occasional seminar. Some are really quite closely involved. We got funding for a range, to hold a range of events. So we had about, about 50 events over the last sort of five or six years seminars, workshops, public lectures, etc. Uh, um, we also had funding to, to start pilot projects. So we had around, we had six and then a new one was added. So we actually had seven pilot projects and each of them had around two half a dozen to a dozen researchers, um, uh, anything from senior to, to junior scholars. And I'll say a few words about them in a minute. And sort of the, the colleagues that sort of were part of that came from, you know, like me, as far as from politics, international relations, but we have people from art history, from communication, from journalism, anthropology, psychology, we had computer scientists, architecture, so on. So it was very interdisciplinary and um, it was a, sort of an exciting start. So what I want to say now primarily, or what I want to talk about is sort of the lessons I've learned as, as uh, uh, Eric and Christian have, have asked me to do. Um, first to the positive sides. Uh, there's a huge interest in the visual and it's, it was absolutely fascinating how people came from a whole range of different disciplines who had uh, an interest in visual work uh, and in the links between visuals and, and politics. Uh, people were very keen to collaborate, uh, particularly when money was involved, and I'll say a few words, a few more words about that uh, later on. Um, and there were lots of exciting projects that emerged from, from this idea. I'll say a few words about the seven pilot projects that came out of it. We had one on how images shape responses to humanitarian crisis. And that, that's the one I, I, I collaborate. And I'll say a few words about that after all. After, uh, at the end, that's sort of the main project I am working on at the moment. Um, uh, there was a project on the politics and ethics uh, of film and communications project run by Tom O'Regan with Tate Manicelli and Marguerite Lacaz. There was on, um, uh, and most of these kind of pilot projects had, these are just two or three people I mentioned here, but most of them had six to 12 people, PhD students, so they're in, in themselves quite interesting sort of interdisciplinary uh, programs. And the idea is to, to kind of bring people in from different disciplines. There's one program on a, a media lab that uses sort of uh, video technology to simultaneously record a whole range of different channels and then analyze them, run by, by Martin Weber and Seth Kemp and Eric Lowe. There's sort of a, a post-colonial uh, English studies project on uh, visual archives using visual and verbal technologies to analyze kind of refugee testimonies and, and social justice run by Gillian Whitlock. Uh, there's one on indigenous art and global black power that's still active. I'm involved in that. And at the moment we put in a grant proposal on 
basically uh, Australian, Australian indigenous art as a protest form and as a way of establishing a dialogue between indigenous people and settler communities. Uh, then we had one on new computational methods in visual politics run by Dan Angus, so using, using big computers to crunch massive amounts of visual data on, on Instagram, particularly uh, Dan does that. And then we have one on visualizing Korea, uh, uh, using uh, taking people from, from cultural studies, from linguistics and so on. And Korea is sort of my third home. I worked there as a Swiss diplomat in the Korean DMZ uh, 30 years or so ago, and I do work on, on Korea as well, I mean, both. So these are very, very different projects, in different disciplines, and we often get together for, for kind of seminars, for workshops, for to exchange ideas, to get feedback. And all that has been quite positive. And I think one of the things, I think, I believe it, it was either Eric or Christian mentioned it at the beginning, one of the nice things with visual politics with a program like that is you can combine basically focus and scale. That means you can bring a whole range of people in from computer science, from art history, but because you focus on something specific on, on visuals and politics, you actually have something in common. Uh, and, and that's, you know, something that is interesting and that is, that is uh, to me, is, is cutting edge. And there's definitely a lot of interest in it. You know, many of our seminars had 50, 60 participants, so plenty of interest. So that's the positives. And in a few words, I'm going to get my, my, my timer up again. Some of the challenges I've encountered, there's sort of two sets of them. One of them is it's very easy to advocate interdisciplinary work. Everyone wants it, everyone says it's great, but in reality, we live in a disciplinary world and we do face a lot of challenges due to that disciplinary world. Uh, for one, for instance, you know, funding in our case was limited. It was, it was kind of uh, limited to three, four years, but to, to do genuine collaboration across discipline, for instance, does take time. It takes a lot of time for people to jump out of their disciplinary settings, to, to learn new things, to, to, to do something different. So I think that, on, that only works if you really have a reasonably long-term uh, um, uh, uh, framework. Then, you know, I got this funding. Uh, uh, that was fantastic to work across the faculty. But at the same time, my real life, or my, my, my main life, was in my department. Uh, and I didn't have any teaching relief with the funding. So basically, I continued all my normal teaching, research, uh, uh, um, management duties, and had to run the program on top of that because, you know, I was embedded in a very disciplinary kind of context. Uh, and that sort of support as a result fluctuated depending on, on who was head of school, who was, uh, who was the... Uh, and the second aspects that they're probably more challenging, they have to do with our own minds. Uh, it's very, very easy in my experience to get people together from different disciplines, to talk about things, but to actually think generally through interdisciplinary work is a, is a lot more difficult, you know, for people to actually read stuff outside the discipline, to read in communications, to read in, in art history, to read in computer science. Most people just continue reading and thinking in their own discipline. Uh, that was illustrated sort of at work, for instance, with, uh, and I'll mention that in a minute, I work with people, social psychologists, who do quantitative work, uh, survey experiments on how people respond to images. I come from a post-structural background, very much qualitative, and I think as Davan mentioned before, there is this kind of really unproductive divide between quantitative and qualitative scholars. You know, I think this is completely ridiculous. Uh, some of my post-structural colleagues said, you know, you, you sold out, you went over to the enemy because you worked with quantitative people. That's ridiculous. I think we all can use different kind of tools to understand politics. And to me, that's one of the interesting things was in this interdisciplinary program is to bring people together who would otherwise not even sit on the same table. But for instance, we had to first find a common language. You know, the, the psychologists I work with, they, they think completely differently. They, they phrase things differently. So the first few months, we just had to find a way of actually being able to communicate across disciplines about how to study visuals. Uh, same is, of course, if you look at, you know, where do you publish if you put people together from different disciplines? You know, we, uh, it's nice to say, let's do interdisciplinary work, but ultimately, most people in our field, you know, in order to uh, get jobs, to get a promotion, you know, have to publish in the right journals. In our field, you know, if you have something in I.O., in ISQ, you're basically sitting comfortable. If I publish something in the leading communication uh, studies journal, I apply for promotion and people don't even know that journal. You know, it gets completely lost. So, so we all in our discipline sort of 
basically compelled to play the disciplinary game, even if we do interdisciplinary research. So with my social psychology colleagues, for instance, we have to figure out if we do a joint paper, where do we send it? Do we send it to political psychology? Do we send it to the review of international studies? Very different kind of audience, different literatures you have to engage. Um, and the, the, the last sort of challenge I found is there's a lot of people who are very generally interested in, in, in what we do, in collaborating, in being part of it. Others, however, you know, they were keen to be on board when there was funding. And when the funding was gone, they stopped showing up at seminars at, and so on. So there's different levels of commitment because people are, again, they, they're kind of bound by their disciplinary uh, settings, by the, the pressures they face in their departments. Um, but by and large, if I compare, I think the advantages by a long shot over, over, overweighing the disadvantages. It was a fantastic experience. It's really exciting to work across disciplines. Uh, but it's something that does take time and does entail facing challenges. Now, if I have a couple of minutes left, do I have a bit of time left, um, Christian? Yes, yes. You you still have you still have about um, 10, 15 minutes if you want. Good. I don't need that much. That's my Swiss obsession is being punctual and being ahead of time. So uh, so I'll probably stay about 10 minutes or so on on the main program a project that I'm putting together at the moment. Uh, that we have two that I'm involved with as part of this program. One is on on um, indigenous art and, and protests, and the other one is on visualizing uh, Korea from interdisciplinary perspectives. But the main project I'm putting on together is one on visualizing humanitarian crisis. Uh, and it's sort of the, the basic sort of premise of the pro project is uh, we all know that prevailing visualizations of humanitarian crisis are quite problematic. You know, people recognize, for instance, that images like that, they portray victims in the global south as in very stereotypical ways, as passive, uh, lacking any agency, uh, just waiting to be receiving Western help, so very stereotypical, very neo-colonial. Uh, we know a lot about um, compassion fatigue, for instance. We know a lot about um, um, about the extent to, to which images tend to focus on on crisis rather than on solutions. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of a lot of stuff we know about why images of crisis are problematic, but we know a lot less about how basically alternative, more ethical images would look like, and we know even less about how people, including, uh, for instance, donors, would react to those images. So this whole project basically is trying to figure out how we can depict humanitarian crisis in more ethical, alternative ways. And we bring together uh, 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 just people from a whole range of different disciplines. So we, come, we have people in my field, for instance, uh, here at UQ, um, I work with Alex Bellamy and Ms. Emma Hutchison, uh, but you, you also have people in social psychology. Uh, uh, we've worked with uh, Matthew Hornsey, Cassandra Chapman here, and Fiona Barlow. Uh, they, for instance, they don't do the work we do on analyzing images through semiotics or discourse analysis. They actually do surveys to look at how we um, actually respond, how people respond to images, what emotions to have, how it might influence their donation behavior. And then we work with people uh, in a range of different disciplines, uh, in geography, in history, Communications, most of you, I guess, are in communication. So we work with Lilia Joliaki at, at the LSC. So it's, it's a very interdisciplinary team. And I've worked for the last three years, basically, on putting this team together. And we're about to put in a grant with the Australian Research Council for a scheme that's called the Linkage Scheme. And the idea of that scheme is to basically team up academics or teams of academics with what is called industry partners. Yeah. And the idea is basically whatever financial contribution you can bring up or you can you can gather from industry partners you can then apply for real funding to to finance postdocs phd students uh, surveys and the like so over the last three years i've many, managed to get on board four industry partners for four institutions so we have the world press Spoda foundation in amsterdam where i work with uh, david campbell a long-term colleague who and, and sort of the world press forward the, the part of the project they do is we we will have a photography competition uh, aimed at photographers from the global south uh, with the idea of basically brainstorming blue sky uh, about how we could depict crisis in more ethical ways, in alternative ways. Uh, and then afterwards, we will use the sources we gathered uh, in order to test them through a variety of empirical uh, testing methods. Uh, 
We work with the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, where we work with Fiona Terry, who's done fantastic work on humanitarianism, a very influential book called Condemned to Repeat. Uh, so the ICSC plays a whole range of different roles. They give us access to projects they do. They have ex excellent uh, policy expertise. We work with the Australian Red Cross, uh, and they are fantastic because they have actually, one of the real leaders in their field, they have spearheaded a move for what they call needs-based to strengths-based photography. Uh, so we can access the entire data bank and look basically at the relationship between images and donation behavior in terms of their responses and their, their, uh, their experiences. And we work with Médecins Sans Frontières uh, Australia, uh, and they, that they allow us to do live experiments in the context of a real campaign that they're running, again, to sort of see how donors respond differently to conventional images versus alternative images of crisis. Uh, so that's sort of in very, very brief, uh, um, uh, a project I've tried to put together over the last three years, about to put in for funding, and if you're successful, I hope I will get four years of funding for postdocs, PhDs, and a range of activities. So, and in many ways, putting that project together ha had similar exciting aspects and similar challenges than what I mentioned before. You know, it's fantastic to get people together, but not easy to group people from such different disciplines, get them on board for the same project with different assumptions about what research is, different epistemological assumptions, different methodological approaches. And to me, that's precisely what exciting research is, it's sort of to get outside your comfort zone, to work with people who really you would not usually encounter and see can we figure out something in common that that allows us to do a project that none of us could do on our own because we don't have the methodological or conceptual skills to really work across all these various aspects um, but i think i've rambled on uh, too long uh, uh, i might pause at that uh, and perhaps if possible we could have a bit of a conversation on that i would love to hear from you what experiences you have made with interdisciplinary work with the kind of excitement and the challenges that are involved in them so thank you so much Roland this was you know uh, really really interesting and absolutely right on time as as one would expect from a Swiss citizen <laughs> uh, right. there's been there's been a lot of discussion in in the chat um, well, one that just came in uh, from Kirk Key. Uh, do you have any specific advice on practical strategies for creating interdisciplinary collaborations? In your experience, what works? Um, well, look, I mean, uh, getting together physically is always something that works. Uh, I think, you know, think of, of, of something you have in common, like a, a research puzzle, a research problem, problem get people together, but then I think the challenge is that people don't just come, do their work and go home again and sort of, you know, might be exposed to interesting ideas, but basically just afterwards continue the same kind of project. I think if you want to do something genuine, you have to expect that, that this will take time. That, you know, that people, for instance, read each other's work, that you read outside your discipline, that you read, again, I'm a political scientists, I do international relations, but you know, I try to read in communications, I try to read in art history, I try to read in computer science, and does does involve to really go outside of your disciplines and, and look at what other people have worked on in, in their discipline. That takes that takes time. It takes getting to learn different languages, different citation practices, different epistemologies. It takes time and commitment, but I think uh, uh, putting that commitment in to me is is really worthwhile, even if there are challenges involved. Uh, Great. Do you think, I mean, as when you, when you were talking about, you know, interdisciplinarity, I was thinking about, you know, the idea of, you know, communication as a post-discipline, uh, which is being recently articulated by Sylvia Weisbord, you know, the idea that uh, we come together more to solve problems, uh, specific problems, to answer specific questions than to advance you know a particular theory of communication uh which is the case in in, in more traditional disciplines um i wonder if you've you know found that framework helpful i mean the project you presented seems to be a, a kind of like you know problem oriented project you know how do we improve the visual representation of humanitarian crisis is is this a useful approach to you absolutely that's absolutely spot on that's exactly uh, what i do I use a framework in our field by a political theorist, political philosopher, Ian Shapiro, 
who basically critiqued the North American political science for being methods driven, you know, often quantitative methods driven. And he says basically to do good research, it has to be puzzle driven. You know, you never start your research with a method, you start with a fundamental puzzle about understanding the world. For instance, in our case, about, you know, how to do better images of the humanitarian crisis. And I think once you have a really interesting puzzle, then you go on to looking how to investigate it. And you can basically draw on any kind of resources from any discipline, you know, or even from outside academia. You can draw on popular culture and something that's written on your cereal box, on, on hip hop songs. It doesn't matter where you get the information from. If the information is relevant to the research puzzle, it's legitimate. Uh, so for instance, I use a lot of visual autoethnography. I just done a recent essay on on using my own photographs from having worked in the Korean demilitarized zone uh, 30 years ago to rethink security dilemmas. And, and to me, if you do puzzle driven research, uh, if whatever information you can find, whether it's through your own photographs, whether it's through quantitative work, whether it's through a discourse analysis, if it helps you understand and engage the puzzle and respond to the puzzle, then it's legitimate research. And to me, that's the base of interdisciplinary research because it's not based on disciplinary conventions. It's not based on having to adhere to disciplinary standards. It's based around understanding puzzles. And, and it's interesting to see that in communication, there's a move uh, in that direction and well, as well. And to me, that's what I practice in my research. That's what I do with my PhD students. I get them to start with a puzzle before they do anything else. And once they have the puzzle, I ask them to look into who has written on that before, what's the state of the field, and then develop a set of methodologies to, to engage that puzzle. And uh, to me, that's precisely how you do interdisciplinary research. So very interesting to hear that from a different discipline as well. Yeah, great. Uh, Eric has a question. Uh, could a visual politics initiative be formed, you know, without significant pre-existing funding? Uh, in your case, did, did, did it help that you already had a group that was established, uh, which you were, you know, uh, transitioning towards this field, or do you think there is, there is scope to just start it up from scratch? Yes, I think there's definitely scope. I mean, look, at, as I said, I've for many years, I just run an informal visual politics cluster in our school, which is set together. We, we, we formed a sort of a, an intellectual community, a supportive community. So I think that that worked very well. The, the challenge is, as I flagged, is that, you know, you often then have to do that in addition to your normal duties and running the program I've done. It's quite a lot of work. I ran about six or seven seminars a semester. You know, you have to line up the speakers, you have to do a program, you have to advertise. Um, uh, we do collaborative research projects. It does take a, a lot of time. Um, and, and if you want to do it at that level, I think it would definitely help to have some kind of uh, either a teaching buyout for a course a year or something that helps you kind of make, make it manageable. But I don't think it's necessary. I think, you know, I think it's often a matter of just trying to, to create a, a sense of community, get people in. Uh, here in Brisbane, for instance, we have three or four universities. We have to have people from different universities popping in. Uh, and, and that sort of helps to create a community outside of a normal disciplinary departmental school context and, and, and create that. So I think it's a matter of uh, having a certain willingness and perhaps putting in the energy uh, two or three people to, to do that. So. Yeah, yeah, and this is probably, you know, encouraging advice at a time where hopefully for a short time, you know, universities won't have a lot of money to throw at new initiatives. So we, yeah. we all we will all need to make do with what we have. We will have uh, to make do, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any new questions, but, you know, people feel free to uh, add questions to the chat. Um, I have one, you know, as a, you know, your work has really a, a global scope um, and a global ambition. And, you know, as, as a comparativist myself, you know, I wonder is, in your opinion, you know, it's obviously always very challenging to study communication across contexts because, you know, words might have different meanings in different contexts, in different times, in different places. Uh, do you see images as being, uh, you know, more culturally determined than, than words uh, or differently culturally determined? Or, or is the language of images somehow more universal than than the actual language and written and the written language. Yeah, I mean, I mean, with that sort of with Tom, with Tom Mitchell, who sort of says that basically we don't have a world in which we have purely images and purely world. That all media is in some sense mixed media. That that images never make sense out of themselves. No images have to be interpreted. Images make sense 
in relation to previous images, to our memory bank we have in our head about an image. You know, if I see an image, I don't know, in Christian uh, in your background, you know, I have a certain understanding of Fernand Leger and of, of a whole range of uh, kind of impressions I had, you know, in my case, when I lived in Paris and seen that. So that image only makes sense to me in relation to a whole range of images that are in my head already and then in other people's head. And of course, the images in, in media, particularly, they only make sense in the context of verbal presentations, of captions, of the way they're presented. Um, for instance, we, we've done some research here uh, on the visualizations of refugees in Australia. So we've done a 10-year content analysis of the uh, how, how refugees are presented in the Australian media over 10 years and and one of the things you found is basically that that um, uh, refugees are very much dehumanized visually dehumanized because the overwhelming sort of visualization of refugees if we do look at the content analysis is refugees being shown in the medium to large groups and boats and there's lots of social psychology studies that around the identifiable victim effect that show that basically we're most likely to feel empathy if we see an individual victim, a person with a face, a person that is identifiable with a story. And if you look at 10 years of patterns of visualizations of refugees, you see hardly any kind of uh, refugees with individual faces. You see masses. And people are more likely to respond with fear, with anger uh, to these visual representations. But, and that's the point, these visual representations don't work by themselves. They work in relation to a verbal discourse around cue jumping, around a national defense about seeing refugees, refugees not as a humanitarian sort of responsibility but as a threat to security as a question of border control for instance so i think that shows that basically the visual and the verbal are never completely separate they always work in in tandem they always have to be studied i think in 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 that combination in that in that setting so yeah, great that's that's really insightful um we've got something from delia dumitrescu um she said, I totally empathize with the difficulty to publish interdisciplinary work on visual politics. Uh, any advice from, for promoting this type of work uh, while it you know, struggles from one journal to the other and from one reviewer to, to, to the other? And hi, Delia. Yeah, look, this to me is one of the most difficult and frustrating things. And ideally, when I write something, for instance, I want to write for myself. I just want to write. I write to find something out. So I don't have something in mind, I dig, and I feel writing is the only way for me to really find out what's going on. But then of course, once you've done that, you have got to figure out where do, we, where do you send it? And inevitably you have to be strategic. You know, if I send something to a journal, for instance, I spend first, I read the last 10 years of that journal, I read all the articles in there that are in remotely kind of uh, uh, related to my topic and I engage them in my essay because that's most likely going to be via referees. You have to be familiar with the citation style, with the writing style. So you have to, no matter what you write, you have to tailor it to that particular journal. And, you know, in our field, there's a pecking order. I'm sure in communications as well, you know, there's a very clear pecking order in terms of what are the top five, six journals that have a rejection rate of 90% that you want to get in, that you know when it gets in, it's going to be read very widely. Uh, so you aim for these first and then you go down. But that's a discipline journal. Uh, and sometimes I do work with other people and we aim for, for journals in different disciplines. And, and then of course you have to read a whole different bodies of literatures. You have to have certain citation practices. You have to cite X and Y rather than uh, F and, and K because in order to, to, to be acceptable for that particular kind of journal. I wish there were more genuinely interdisciplinary journals and maybe that's something that we could we could think about uh, uh, of creating journals that are generally interdisciplinary. There's some of them out there in our field, for instance, uh, uh, um, um, the journal Peace Building is fairly interdisciplinary. It's in politics, but it also encourages work from education from a whole range of different journals. But most journals in my field that are really influential are disciplinary journals. And, and there's limits to what you can publish there, limits to the audience as well who reads them. and, and yeah, that's sort of one of my frustrations. And I don't really have, I'm afraid, I don't really have any kind of golden solutions or easy solutions to, to, to deal with that. Um, except to recognize it, to, to know that you have to play the politics. Um, and, and ultimately, look, at, I think 
I'm also, speaking of, of publications, I'm a big fan of writing in everyday language, of not writing in academic jargon, but really writing, starting with a puzzle, as we said, starting with a puzzle and really writing in an everyday accessible language. And if you do so, I think you have greater chances of placing a, an interdisciplinary kind of article that, that's out there, that does funky work across disciplines, placing that in a mainstream journal, whatever the discipline is. If you're able to communicate accessibly without soft disciplinary jargon, your chances of placing interdisciplinary uh, research is a lot higher than if you use whether it's communication jargon or politics jargon or, or, or um, you know, anthropology jargon, that's always boxes you into a corner. So. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, we got a question from Dean um, who says, you know, at least within PolySci, we keep talking about the how, what the, how the visual achieves meaning and we interpret the visual through other media, primarily words. Um, so I suppose we talk about, you know, a picture representing masses versus faces in your example. Um, do we miss something when we think about words doing something to images rather than also thinking about images doing something to words? Uh, so in other words, how, do, how visuals interpret how we understand and interpret uh, words that, that accompany the visuals? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. And nice to see Dean here as a, as a subversive political scientist has entering the, the discussions as well. So uh, it's good to see that. Um, look, I, I think what, one, one of the problems is that we're often just not very well skilled in thinking visually and in doing visual things. And we have to be more, because we, we work in verbal disciplines, we work in uh, publications, properties are verbal, we often use images to see illustrations. So I think it would take uh, quite a lot of rethinking, retraining, redoing to actually start thinking in visual terms and see what the visual can bring back to work. So in our discipline, for instance, there's quite a few people uh, starting to work on, on video, so sort of presenting academic work, not just in terms of textual practices with images illustrating things, but actually doing videos or doing, doing uh, photo essays as part of academic work to pre precisely deal with that issue that, that, that we don't just, just see the visual as illustrations of what we do or as empirical material, but actually as sources of insight themselves. And, but that's, you know, intellectual thinking practices, reading practices, knowing practices are deeply entrenched and it takes quite a long time to rethink them, to rethink the, the publication practices around them. But I think stuff is going on. My sense is younger generations of scholars do a lot more interesting, funky work, push the boundaries of knowledge. And, and you can do that today in our field, at least in political science. I said when, I, when I started off, our journals were so narrow. I sent them something and the response I always got that was interesting, but sent that to an art history journal, sent that to a literary journal. You know, that's not politics. But today we do have journals, we do have kind of practices that are broader and broader and, and allow us to, to bring in, in more work. Uh, it's, I think if we do funky alternative work, you have to be super sure that you have your, whatever, you, you, your dots linked up and you have everything so on. But I think there's more possibility and I see a younger generation of scholars doing really, really interesting work and, and pushing the boundaries of what, what we can do. So, so it's quite exciting for me to see that. Uh, on that, Eric asks you if you can describe what you mean by funky work, and I think that could funky be a work. nice way to nice way to end this session. Yeah, I, I see myself as doing funky international relations. That's my description of my own work. It's sort of basically breaking the mold of doing fairly predictable and only empirical work, and really trying to be creative, trying to think about political puzzles differently, trying to use different methods, different insights, different uh, different different ways of knowing things. So to me, it's sort of, you know, the, the more interesting things always come from left field, from approaches that are not necessarily well practiced and are entrenched, but from really challenging how we know about the world, from linking epistemologies with empirical practices. So again, it doesn't mean you can't do empirical work, and I do work with people who do quantitative work, but it does think, I think it entails really rethinking really about what, what politics is, what communication is, how, how we know something, and using different ways of, of challenging our, our sort of inherited ways of knowing and practicing knowledge and, and understanding the world. Uh, so I'm not sure if funky is the right word, but um, it sort of captures it in a, maybe creative is a, is a more acceptable term, so. Well, as someone who has used the word wacky to describe some of my own work, you know, I can definitely relate to that. Wacko IR, yeah.
Yeah, no, I, I, I like funky. I think stick with that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one takeaway from this session. Uh, we're exactly at time. Uh, we have a 10 minutes break, uh, which you know you can use to stretch your legs, get a cup of coffee. And we will reconvene exactly at 10. And I'm going to hand over the uh, hosting privilege to Eric right now. Uh, so, you know, thanks very much. You know, feel just, just keep your microphones unmuted and, you know, your video if you want to. And uh, see you very, very shortly. I'll be taking my leave and, and going to uh, sleep. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for uh, inviting me. Good night. Thank see you, Devon. Good night. Thanks a lot, Devon. And also to all our presenters. We really appreciate it. This would be a virtual round of applause.